Will I see you again? No. <laughs> there are other worlds. This one is done with me. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Ear Read This, a podcast providing critical introductions to our favourite works of literature. I'm Ash, your host, and today I'll be talking about The Life of Merlin by Geoffrey of Monmouth. We first met Geoffrey last year when we spoke about his earlier work, The Prophecies of Merlin, published first independently and later included in his prose opus, The History of the Kings of Britain. The Life of Merlin, Geoffrey's last publication, is a narrative poem made up of 1,529 lines of hexameter verse. First appearing in around 1150, the life presents us with an older Merlin, a king of southwest Wales, and prophet, who is driven mad with grief following a battle with the Scots. Passages of political prophecy and 12th century science are interspersed in this story of Merlin's madness, his time as a wild man of the woods, and eventual recovery of his senses, in a work that makes what J.S.P. Tatlock calls a fumbling step towards medieval romance. The life of Merlin reaches us complete in only one manuscript, the Cotton Vespasian E4, kept at the British Library. There it bears the title Vita Melini, because it is of course written, like the history of the kings of Britain, in Latin. Which is why I'm very grateful to be joined today by Mark Walker, who has published the first verse translation of the poem in English. Mark is a writer and teacher of classics, whose publications include a historical novel set during the fall of the Roman Empire, a collection of short stories also set in the ancient world, and three non-fiction works for Latin learners and enthusiasts. Perhaps most eye-catchingly, he has not only translated today's text out of Latin and into English, but performed the reverse on The Hobbit, translating Tolkien into Latin. To hear more about this, don't miss tomorrow's extended interview. In the meantime, if you want to check out Mark's work, I've left a link in the episode description box below. I've also left a link to our Patreon page, where you can support the podcast whilst accessing exclusive monthly content. I began our conversation by asking Mark what had happened to Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 15 or so years between writing The Prophecies and The Life. Well, yeah, that's a great question, because we don't know a lot. And in fact, there's, there's some people like, these days, scholarship seems, not that I'm an expert on this, but in you know, there was there was for a while some doubt about whether Jeffrey was actually the author of of the Life of Merlin, and I think you know I th I think my impression is I remember when I was researching this a little bit when I was writing the translation that you know I think the consensus is it was definitely him and I, and I'm sure anybody who reads the history and then reads the Life of Merlin it's pretty clear it's the same guy I, I feel anyway um, just sort of textually in terms of there's there's a lot of sort of stylistic traits in his latin because obviously as it's written in latin and you know and he he like it like i suppose everybody in those days and, and subsequently is is not a native latin speaker and you know and he's he's picked up latin in the way that people pick up latin those of us who still do it uh you know at school and things and um and and it seems to me that 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 it textually it, it's there are lots of lots of echoes of the history even though the life of Merlin is a poem and it's written in hexameter verse it, it it's there's an awful lot of verbal ticks and and repeated sort of um expressions and things that seem to seem to indicate to me at least that it, this there's no real doubt that it, it's the same author and there's, there's a lot of times in the in the poem that he he goes to a lot of trouble to convince us that the Merlin who is he's writing about in the poem who is speaking in the poem is the same Merlin of the history and the same Merlin of the prophecies of Merlin and he that which that came first didn't it the prophecies came first that he wrote the prophecies of Merlin as a sort of separate little publication on its own and then that was incorporated into his history in what was that the 1130s ish you know round about sometime in the 1130s and when the history the, the the history which is a big chunky big fat book but it's got the prophecies as a sort of separate book in in it after he's introduced the merlin character in the history um and then the the, the life of merlin which is and the reason why i think people have struggled with 
identifying it is because it was never really published as such. Not so much that books were formally published in the 12th century as such, were they? You know, but you know that the, the history of the kings of Britain and the prophecies of Merlin, but so the history generally exists in any number of manuscript copies, and it was very widely circulated and massively popular. Whereas I think the life of Merlin only exists. There's only a couple of original manuscripts that have survived, and they were clearly it was circulated amongst a very small relatively small group of people people who were interested in you know latin hexameter verse and that kind of thing which is a far more select group than than the history so the the, the po and the poem is radically is radically different from the history and the character of merlin seems to be radically different which is why people have, have sort of questioned whether it's the same author as but as i said in the poem he does go to some trouble to try and convince us that it's the same Merlin. And he, he mentions himself, doesn't he? Yeah, no, he does write at the end. He says this was written by um, uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth, you know, who wrote the, he who wrote the, and he gives us the proper title of the history because we often call the book the history of the Kings of Britain, but I think it's it's got a slightly different title, something like the deeds of the Kings or something like that. And he, gives it a slightly different title but yeah he does the very last line couple of lines of the the life he says this was written by but that could I suppose that could have been a spurious little addition couldn't it by somebody trying trying to claim it as his but I, I honestly personally I don't see any reason to doubt it and having read a few a few scholarly articles on this um I, th I think as far as I can tell, the consensus these days is that it definitely is by him and it's no real. And one of the reasons why I suppose there's no reason to doubt it is there's there's no other candidate. Who else who else would have written an epic poem about Merlin, for goodness sake? You know, because, you know, Merlin is Geoffrey's creation in that way, isn't he? So. Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote The Life of Merlin in Hexameter, the poetic form found in the didactic verses of classical writers like Hesiod and Lucretius. J.S.P. Tatlock calls the poem a favourable specimen of medieval metrical verse, with relatively scarce false quantities, avoiding elision or hiatus, and rather, though not to excess, cultivating verbal jingles. Mark and I will discuss the metre in a bit more depth on tomorrow's episode, but to give you a flavour of it, here is Merlin in Mark's translation, refusing bribes from King Ruthurch. Miserly men love fights, and the greedy for presents do labour, Bending their will to wherever commanded, complacent and supine. Bribes have corrupted their hearts, their possessions no longer sufficient. Acorns and glistening springs that flow through the odorous meadows of Caledonian woods, such treasures for me are sufficient. I am not moved by your bribes, let the miser delight in your bounty. It's quite a long line with a caesura in the middle, and you can hear it has that kind of odd rolling thrust like a wave that won't quite break. This is because dactylic hexameter was intended for Latin, and as a result has never been particularly popular among English poets. We'll mention a few exceptions tomorrow, but as Mark says in his introduction, to translate the life of Merlin in iambic blank verse would perhaps have produced a smoother, more idiomatic version. To use English hexameter is perhaps the more eccentric choice. But everything about Geoffrey's poem is eccentric, mysterious, slightly off-kilter. Peter Goodrich has similarly described the poem as a crazy quilt of styles and subjects, rather than a tightly plotted narrative. It is a world away from the more neutral, instructive tone we found in the history of the Kings of Britain. By contrast, the life, as F.J.E. Raby said, seems like a work written solely for the delight of the reader, a blessed change from imitations of classical tales or outworn moralizings. In terms of the the much smaller circulation, mm. is it wise to think from that that it was kind of an exercise, well, something he did for pleasure? I mean, very, very possibly. Uh, again, it's hard to tell, but he, it's dedicated to his um, sort of patron, who's uh, an aristocrat whose name I forget. I think it was Robert de Chesney or something. It's dedicated to you know, somebody he was close to in in the Oxford circle because Geoffrey spent most of his time although he calls himself Geoffrey of Monmouth and he's clearly from Monmouthshire and he's got that Welsh Anglo-Welsh connection he 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 was based in Oxford we know that much about about him teaching in Oxford when when Oxford was a uh, 
I guess, a proto-university in those days. It wasn't quite officially a university, but he was a teacher in Oxford and he had a sort of literary circle. Uh, and this is before he became a bishop because he becomes a bishop at the end of his life and toddles off to North Wales to become bishop and then dies fairly soon afterwards. The, the, the poem is dedicated to his sort of his aristocratic patron at Oxford. And what you can imagine it was circulated amongst that relatively small circle of literary, you know, the literary elite in, in Oxford, I suppose. Um, but it draws on much more than the history does. It draws on the Welsh stuff, you know, Geoffrey's Welsh heritage. And I think this has led many scholars who've looked at it to sort of surmise that he had after writing the history, or maybe during writing the history, he's rediscovering a lot of Welsh literature. And he's now, and he, that's not really evident in the history at all as such, but by the time he's writing the Merlin story in, in the, as a separate story, he's read all of these things like the Red Book of... of, of um, Carmarthen, the Cabred, thank you, thank you. And, and you know, the stories about Lilo Ken and, and these other wild men of the woods, uh, sort of Welsh slash Scottish slash Celtic legends, um, Irish even, Sweeney, the legend of Sweeney and, and things like that. That he's, he's come across these and read them and now he's incorporating them into his Merlin story in a way that they weren't in the history. So it's, it, it, could, it could be also motivated then, again, we're just speculating, but it could be motivated by him wanting to pass on this this Celtic law and these Celtic stories into you know and bring them into the the the, the sphere of his his Oxford literary circle and using the poem as a as a means of doing that. Anne Lawrence Mathers tells us that for some 500 years the existence of Merlin as an actual historical personage was not only widely accepted but also exerted a very powerful effect. In the wake of Geoffrey's prophecies which confirmed the history and future of Britain, new prophecies were frequently being produced, concerning not only Britain, but the fates of many other countries across Europe. As late as the 18th century, Merlin's name was still linked to political prophecy. Geoffrey wrote his prophecies and history of the kings of Britain during the uncertain last years of Henry I's reign. Without a legitimate heir, Britain was in a precarious position, and sure enough, Henry's death marked the beginning of a 20-year civil war known as the Anarchy. In the life, events from this conflict are foretold by Merlin's sister, Ganiada. She sees Oxford surrounded by soldiers, Lincoln besieged, and famine falling hard on the people of Britain. Coming at the end of the poem, this stark warning mirrors Merlin's grief at the beginning, his madness induced by witnessing the slaughter of friends in battle. Neil Thomas writes that the pressures of war lead Merlin to reassess and deconstruct that heroic fatalism which has historically been the profoundest article of belief for warrior societies, but which now reveals itself to the disabused seer as a disingenuous rationalisation for the ineluctable slaughter of numberless future generations. The battle Merlin fights in at the start of the poem resembles the Battle of Arthuret, which took place, according to the 12th century chronicles, in the year 573. In it, King Gwendolau of Scotland faced off against Prince Peridur and his brother, as well as the Cumbrian king, Rutherch. These three are joined in Geoffrey's poem by Merlin, king of Diffid in southwest Wales. In the chronicles, Peridur and Rutherch are joined not by a king, but a bard, Miradin Wilt, known elsewhere as Merlin Caledonius or Merlin Sylvester. In his History of the Kings of Britain, Geoffrey drew heavily from the 9th century work of Nennius. His earlier depiction of Merlin is based on Nennius's account of a Romano-British warlord, giving us Geoffrey's Merlin Ambrosius. But the heritage of this later, older Merlin in the life is rather more complicated. I mean, he's radically different. He's radically different because in, in the history you first meet Merlin as a young man and he and and Jeffrey it seems Jeffrey has invented Merlin although he uses this later again with this Welsh character called Merthyn who who's written about in these things like the Red Book of Carmarthen and, and other other places uh, and he uses this name and latinizes it as Merlinus which he invents but the story the first story he tells in the history is when 
this young boy is brought before King Vortigern and makes this prophecy about the uh, his Vortigern's tower and underneath the tower there are these dragons fighting and and all of Vortigern's advisors poo poo it and then they dig a hole and they find this the, the dragons and they find the, the the red dragon which is the red dragon of Wales you know which is the symbol of Wales and um, and that story comes originally from. Uh, another a much older historian called Nennius from the ninth century, and in Nennius's uh, history of Britain, which is a relatively short work compared to Geoffrey's, it's, it's given to there's a it's this Vortigern, who is this who's the British king who's fighting the Saxons, the Anglo-Saxons, you know Hengist and Horsa, who are the, the Anglo-Saxon invaders, and Vortigern's been driven into the mountains of Wales by them. And at that point, he summons this lad in, in Nennius. He's called Ambrosius. This character is called Ambrosius, a young boy. And it, but in, in Geoffrey's history, he calls him Merlin Ambrosius because he's, he's clearly fusing these two names. For um, he, he wants to use the name Merlin. And then you get the prophecies of Merlin after that. And then the next time you meet Merlin, it, it's in that context that we're all familiar with subsequently, which is in connection with King Arthur. And, and Merlin, and it's really the the the, the famous scene, if you like, uh, in in the history, is when Merlin transforms Arthur into the likeness of of his of the Duke of Cornwall at Tintagel, so that that Arthur can go and sleep with Igraine, the Duke of Cornwall's Arthur wife. Arthur or Uther? I beg your pardon, Uther. Sorry, Uther, Arthur's dad, of course, because this is the conception of Arthur. Of course, is what we're. Fame, made famous in the movie Excalibur. I don't know if you've seen. If you, if you remember that, the whole the scene in John Borman's Excalibur captures it. But that comes from Geoffrey. Uh, although in Geoffrey, it's less magical because you know Geoffrey sort of says he transforms Uther using his sort of medicines or, or you know potions, if you like, you know, rather than waving a magic wand. Uh, and you don't really see much of. Merlin at all after that so when Arthur is actually bo- so Merlin is instrumental in 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 that way of we we imagine you know the sort of wizard character helping Uther instrumental in the birth of Arthur the conception of Arthur rather um, but then he sort of rather disappears but when he reappears in the poem first of all at the beginning of the poem he's a king he's a king of the Welsh of a Welsh tribe and he's fighting in a battle as a king, and then he's driven mad for slightly obscure reasons, but something to do with with some of his friends and brothers. These brothers are killed, and they're brothers of his his best friend, or his they they are his best friends, or something like that. And these brothers are killed, and and Merlin, this king, is driven mad and goes off to live a life as a wild man of the woods. And this is where you get the lilac end stories and and all of these other. Welsh legends coming in the stories of the wild man of the woods and the sort of inspired madman and all of this kind of stuff and then yeah. Geoffrey brings in all of these stories based on largely based on the the original Welsh sources but but using Merlin as as the now as the character instead of these other people the conception of Merlin in the history is originally as this young man who prophesies and has this sort of ability to make all of these prophecies and then he does things like he's the one who who builds Stonehenge because he brings all the stones from Ireland and builds Stonehenge yeah. <laughs> clear and it gets funny it really in a way and I always find it really that one of the fascinating things about this character of Merlin is that in Geoffrey he's a very he's very hard to grasp what he's actually doing because he, again Geoffrey never calls him a wizard mm. and never calls he never says he uses magic and even when he brings the stones from Ireland, he uses machines. He talks about using machines. And it's like he's some brilliant engineer who's managed to do this amazing feat. And again, like I said, when he transforms Uther, you know, he's using potions or drugs or something. He's not, it's not, it's not the pointy hat magic wand waving guy that we might think. And so even in the history, he's a very enigmatic, interesting character who largely does, in terms of with Arthur, he has very little to do with Arthur. He does pop up at one point, but he doesn't do very much. Um, so when Arthur's around, he, he largely doesn't really have much involvement. But when he does reappear then in the poem, as I said, he's become this very strange, fanciful, wild man of the woods. And again, there's no 
magic, but he does have these prophetic gifts. And that does link back to the prophecies from the original prophecies of Merlin, that one of the linking things is there are prophecies again in the life of Merlin, poem. Um, so which link in with the prophecies of Merlin, which make a connection with those. But as a character, he's a very, very fanciful, eccentric, strange character in the life of Merlin, and extremely eccentric. Um, and I, I wonder, it's partly, I suppose, because Jeffrey's drawing upon these very disparate sources, you know, pulling in tales from, of, from different places that tell stories about different people, and he's mashing them together and make, you know, and having Merlin do all of these things. But, you know, he, 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 he's, he's essentially for most of the poem, he's a madman who is gleefully running around being mad and um, laughing at people. And, but he has that strange, that sort of idea of the, the wisdom, the strange wisdom of the, of, the, of the insane where he's able to see things that other people can't see. And, and you know, at one point he, one point again in a story that is borrowed from an old Welsh legend, he tells the king, who's who's looking after him, that that his wife is committing adultery, and 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 he and he sort of has this wonderful sort of Sherlock Holmes moment where he's sort of deduced from the fact that the, his the wife has got a leaf and a broken twig on on her dress that she's been sporting in the in the bushes with another another man kind of thing which again isn't isn't magic it's not a exactly i think that it's a fascinating thing i think throughout the throughout both the history and the life of merlin he, you know he has these prophetic powers of, of of looking into the future and saying this is going to happen even though as is the way of all good prophecies most of them are so obscure they don't they could mean anything you know they're a bit like Nostradamus and all of those kind of things where the vaguer you make it the more likely as people will read into it what they want to read into it kind of thing but yeah he doesn't he doesn't actually do anything magical ever he's not and and Jeffrey never calls him any word to do with you know the Latin word for you know a, a magician like magus like where we which is hence the word we get magi and the and mage and things like that from Jeffrey never calls him that at all he's, ne he's always a wise man or he's, he's a or is in, in the case of the life of Merlin he's a madman he calls him a madman but um it, it, he never calls him a wizard or a magician or anything like that Jeffrey's composite Merlin used elements of the Welsh Mirrodin as well as the Scottish wild man Lilacan this is a striking departure from the Nennius derived seer found in the history as Anne Lawrence Mathers writes, to combine Merlin the Magician with sexual scandals and other themes derived from Welsh language poems on Mirrodin, the bard driven mad at the Battle of Arthuret, was extraordinary and may explain why the life did not circulate widely. This Merlin is a figure of social dissent, laughing in the face of a king at the idea of his queen's adultery, but also at hapless beggars and a young boy doomed to drown. In fact, laughter is shown to be dangerously provocative in the poem, not only when it comes from Merlin, but when it is directed at him as well. When he arrives at the wedding of his former wife on the back of a stag, he sees the bridegroom give a chuckle, at which point, as Mark's version tells us, all of a sudden he snapped off the horns from the stag he was riding. Angrily brandishing them, he then threw them right at the bridegroom, smashing his skull into bits and expelling the life from his body. Tolstoy supposed that this extraordinary moment was the result of one of Geoffrey's mistakes. In one of his earlier sources, it was written that Merlin didn't ride a stag, but wore an antlered helmet, which he took off to throw at Gwendolyn's new husband. Then again, there are other sources from further afield that Geoffrey may have been inspired by. The Irish had their own legendary wild man, Sweeney, who was known to hold dominion over stags. The Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, like Merlin, lost his wits and left his kingdom to live among beasts in the wild. King Saul, another prophet, when troubled by an evil spirit, was soothed back to his senses in exactly the same manner as Merlin is in the life, by the playing of a cithara, which is a kind of lyre. And Paul Russell has suggested a link between Merlin's exiles from civilization and the exile of Ovid, reflecting, as Russell says, a general anxiety about the nature of poetical and prophetic composition in exile. And why did he write the life of Merlin in verse as opposed to prose like the history? Mm. 
Yeah. I mean, again, I honestly don't know, but it just could be that he wanted, I mean, at the, at the base of this, it might be as something as simple as he wanted to show off his literary credentials. Because at this time, you know, you took, in the 12th century, the ability to write basically an epic poem in hexameter verse is, is quite an achievement. So it's an extremely erudite thing to be able to do, uh, especially in those days when the sources for classical literature and the classical models are actually very scanty, very sparse. Because, you know, at that point, most of the, the texts, that even the ones we're familiar with today, have yet to be rediscovered. Uh, you know, they've only got a very small body of maybe a few poems by Ovid and presumably bits of Virgil and things, but not very much compared to what we have that, that was brought out, you know, in the later sort of Renaissance period. We're, we're in, a, in a kind of, if you like, a, there's a sort of mini proto-Renaissance going on in the 12th century in Europe with, with, a, with places like uh, Oxford and, you know, and I suppose, I suppose Bologna and Paris and becoming, be, beginning to become centres of learning and university centres. But we're still before... The, if you like the Renaissance proper before a lot of the texts that we we know classical texts have been rediscovered. We don't think about it that way round enough, do we? We always they no, they're exactly, closer to exactly. Ovid, so they must have had more. Yes, yes, you'd think he'd have more, but they definitely didn't. You know, and you wonder even at a library in Oxford, in the best, which would have been the best library in in the whole country, would have had hardly any examples of of classical Latin verse or classical latin literature very little and they may have had some at second hand where they've got writers continental writers writing about maybe quoting some of these sources that they've found in monasteries and that are being kept in italy or somewhere but they certainly haven't made it to to britain at this point um so yeah he's got very scanty sources in terms of classical learning and you can tell that from the poem because he very rarely, almost never, does what most neo-Latin authors do, which is quote heavily from the classical authors or reference them. He very rarely, there's a couple of lines where he, he references a line of Ovid, and that's about it. I mean, in the entire poem, and a neo-Latin literature generally, which is in anything from sort of that period, I suppose certainly, certainly Renaissance 14th, 15th century onwards, any neo latin literature generally leans very heavily on, on the classical originals and uses similes and uses vocabulary and things from <laughs> derived from the classical authors, because that's the way the people writing the poem demonstrate their their knowledge of the classical authors. And Geoffrey never does that. He or very I said very rarely does that, which probably indicates he didn't know many of them. He just didn't have access to many of them. So his, his Latin, and, and, and one of the reasons as, as, as a Latin, as a Latinist myself, that, you know, one of the nice things about reading Geoffrey is his, his Latin is quite then, it has its own voice because he's not trying to imitate, he's not trying to imitate Ovid uh, in his verse and he's not trying to imitate Virgil particularly. He's just writing the way he, he's learnt the rules of prosody. He's learnt how to create hexameter verse and he then just goes off and does it how he wants to do it so it's yeah it's 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 it's, it's you know it's, it's a fascinating period in, in a way and, and you know it's one of those things where we where like we we often people often say the dark ages were never really dark because there were people writing and and so, but so much of this and the renaissance was never really a thing because it was going on all the time sort of thing like and so back in jeffrey's day there is there is this classical learning and there is this knowledge, but it's it's in its infancy at this point. And by the time you get to the 14th, 15th century, you know, and you get um, Erasmus and people like that coming along, then you, you've, you're getting a huge flowering of it. But that's that's a, what, several hundred years in the future as far as is concerned. Yeah. The life of Merlin bridges the old world and the new, a story that contains prophecy and poisoned apples alongside astrological readings and medieval politics. During his madness, Merlin gains spiritual insights into the workings of the world. Returned to his senses, these insights are formalised, but still contain a combination of natural and supernatural phenomena. For instance, when he describes the taxonomy and behaviour of birds, he lists swans, herons and woodpeckers alongside the phoenix. Merlin, as Anne Lawrence Mathers says, 
is poised right on the complex boundary between science, natural magic, and necromancy. I love that idea of what you just said about the Merlin being mad because he's because he's built out of multiple sources and maybe heard secondhand. It makes <laughs> it makes such good yeah. sense that therefore yeah. the character is mad. And actually, it seems like um, other authors have tried to come up with ways of reason, like T. H. White's Merlin um, living yes. backwards and therefore yes. mad by forgetfulness. I mean, I think the idea, isn't it, the idea which we're all familiar with now, aren't we? Of the the really eccentric wizard character. You know, in and whether it's whether you know whether it's obviously somebody like Dumbledore or Gandalf who are just Merlin anyway, aren't they? But or whether it's somebody like Doctor Who, you know, who's you know that you know. In many ways, I also I sometimes think Jeffrey's conception of Merlin is a bit more like Doctor Who. Not that he's an alien, but that he, you know, he's this eccentric eccentric genius kind of thing, and and he's such an eccentric genius that everybody thinks he's mad. Yeah. He seems mad to everybody because he, he can see things that other people can't see. He can understand. He understands the world in a far deeper and more profound way than anybody else does. So everybody else thinks he's mad. I was going to say, I, I, it, it does seem very deliberately, the, the poem, to blur the line between madness, magic and um, just just mischief as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mischief as well. You know, he gets up to tricks and he gets into trouble and, and all of this. Exactly right. So that that mischievous sense of which has been preserved for us in, in later incarnations of Merlin as, you know, and the idea of this eccentric and mischievous wizardly character is now familiar to us. But the, the thing that's missing in Jeffrey is, as I said, the really the, the whole magical thing. And I think you have to get to Thomas Mallory where you've got you've got a sort of fully formed idea of Merlin as a, as an actual wizard magician wizard character yeah uh, and he really is there in Mallory but that's not really how Geoffrey saw him at all Merlin is not the only mischief maker in Geoffrey's poem we also meet his sister Ganiada it is she who rescues her brother from the wilds and later builds him a palace in the forest eventually joining him there for a life of study and contemplation Fiona Tolhurst writes that Ganiada gains additional complexity because she functions as a female counterhero, yet Geoffrey does not villainize her. Even when Geoffrey marks Ganiada as an adulteress through a leaf that got caught in her hair during a sexual encounter with her lover, he neither labels her a villain in this part of the plot sequence, nor makes a disparaging comment about women in general based on the moral wrong she has committed. Less interested in determining whether or not adultery has actually occurred, Upon the king's death, Geoffrey has Ganiada mourn her husband with genuine emotion. Can I believe, she says, that the rocks will conceal in their icy embrasures your fair limbs while your body is crumbling to powdery ashes? When she joins her brother and his learned friends at his proto-university in the woods, they are, as Neil Thomas says, essentially forming a monastic cell. We see Ganiada take on a series of roles usually occupied by men, both in literature and out of it. She is a trickster, a prophet, a political philosopher, and a religious scholar. Fiona Tolhurst writes that, as the first character in the life to mention Jesus Christ, Merlin's sister then articulates the Christian philosophical position that people will gain happiness and Christ will grant them an eternal reward if they remain steadfast in both their piety and service to God and then leave their earthly lives. There's lovely moments, like when, when he does first go mad... Um, and in in your version, uh, he he sort of falls after this battle, falls to his knees and mourning in grief for the men. Now his tears fall in rivers unending. Hair he besprinkles with dust, and his clothes he now rips from his body, falling to sprawl on the ground. Now around and around he goes whirling. It sounds simultaneously like someone having a a fit, a mad fit, but also it sounds yes. sort of magical. Yes. Rivers unending, sprinkles of dust whirling around. It sort of sounds like yeah, magic yeah, yeah. as well. It's... I mean, it's that lovely poetical... I mean, I think that's the nice thing about Geoffrey, and, and I've said my English translation for what it's worth, tries tries at least to capture it a bit, as much as you can. But, the, the, you know, you know, the, the, he, he's not a flowery poetical writer who uses a lot of epic similes or anything, but he uses he just uses these nice descriptive phrases and 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 very rich kind of language that 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 uh, that brings the scene very vividly like that and then you get him after then he goes rushing off into the forest 
and he runs, you know, and there's sort of scenes with him running with the animals and the deer and things and having and eating all the fruits of the trees. But of course, he's completely forgotten that he's in northern England or, or Wales or wherever he is. He's in Cumbria. Or, he's either in Cumbria or on the borders or somewhere. And he's completely forgotten what happens in the winter. And then when winter comes, he's he's absolutely miserable and having a terrible time. And he has to be he has to be rescued by a messenger from the king who comes to bring him from his sister who brings him back to the court because he's he's there sort of starving in the forest you know in the middle of winter so. <laughs> and uh, when he does go back to the court we meet Ganyeda who's another mysterious yes. character the the moment yeah. you described earlier is played very ambiguously the wh- whether she's guilty or not yeah and how she immediately yes is yeah, yeah. defensive and um uh, and immediately on with a scheme was her relationship and character i know she sort of was she, her she comes from the welsh sources as well but her yeah her sort of relationship to merlin and character his invention well i think what he does what jeffrey's good this is what jeffrey's good at is he's taking hints and names from the sources where they're not really developed as characters you know they're just mentioned or you know this sort of idea of the him picking up on the adultery is is a is a is an episode from one of the earlier Welsh sources, but Geoffrey just sort of enriches it and gives these people their own character and their own motivations, and and just makes them more interesting and and tells a rounded narrative and tells a rounded story, which makes it interesting and to to read and more more um more like a proper story. And he's I think that's the thing about Geoffrey generally, isn't it? That he he's an amazing storyteller and. You know, and if we just pause for a moment, back go back to the history. I mean, the the history is in a. I always find just jaw dropping because, although it's called the history of the kings of Britain and it's notionally one of these medieval Latin histories, like in the tradition of Bede or somebody Bede's ecclesiastical history, it, there's no history at all in Geoffrey's book. It's complete fantasy, the whole thing from beginning to end. You know, it's it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, but he's He's either used sources that we don't have anymore because nobody's really sure where he gets a lot of this stuff from, apart from little bits. Like I said, with the Merlin Ambrosius episode, there's, for example, there are certain places where he's grabbed bits. Mm. But so much of it, whether it's the story, I mean, he tells us the story of King Lear and his three daughters, and and which Shakespeare then borrowed uh, and that comes from Geoffrey and and you know when, when he gets on when he finally gets around to King Arthur I mean what King Arthur does K- King Arthur rampages around Europe and defeats you know and defeats the Romans and things you know and it's like and all of this kind of stuff and and battles giants and and things and it's all just a mash it's like this massive it's very modern you know it's this sort of this sort of mashup of different genres where you've got giants that you're fighting at one time and then the next time he's fighting romans and roman legions and all of this kind of stuff it's just great you know but it's all as i said it's either jeffrey has had a load of secret sources that have completely lost or he's just made it all up and i tend to think probably he just made it all up because he seems to be such a good storyteller so even in the life of merlin which is a, a different beast but he he's got his eye on the story and, and the characters as well you know and so you've got the king and uh, you know and ganyada merlin's sister is the king's wife and then you've got then then you've got a character you've got merlin's own wife who pops up at one point and i think that's a, i think she if i if i remember rightly i don't think she's in any of the sources you know the idea that the merlin himself has a wife is jeffrey's own invention and then he can tell this story about Merlin has gone off to be mad in the forest his wife has decided she's going to remarry and then Merlin gate crashes the wedding comes riding in on a stag and and kills the groom yes exactly yes poor old groom doesn't come out of it very well absolutely right yes 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 but you know the the thing is it's such a curious work the life of Merlin and and I guess one of the reasons why to come back to that point about it being only existing in a few very small manuscripts is Unlike the history, it's not very much a connected, despite what I've just said, which is, I still, you know, I think is absolutely the case that, that Jeffrey is a great storyteller and he tells this story of Merlin. It's it's punctuated throughout by these massive digressions about really a 
that don't seem to have it, at least on the face of it, don't seem to have anything to do with the story as such. And they're, they're, they're digressions. I th and again, if we come back to the idea that Jeffrey is writing this for a kind of literary elite, a circle of cognoscenti in, in Oxford, he's, he's using the poem to, to, to tell them and show off about his kind of cutting edge knowledge of natural history and, and, and of science at the time and things like that. So he's writing about the migration of birds and how fishes behave and, and weather, you know, what the weather, what weather, how weather works and things like that, what causes weather to happen and, and all of this kind of stuff. So he's writing about things in the natural world, um, using, again, using his best sources for this kind of what we would call scientific or, you know, biology, natural history sort of information. And it it comes in with or along with it comes um, Taliesin, if I'm saying that right. Yes, yes. Could you tell us a little, yes, little bit absolutely. about who he is and and why you think he might have been? Well, again, he, I mean, he's he's a character lifted directly from his own poems because there's the Welsh tradition of Taliesin, the bard, has his own cycle of po very famous Welsh poems dedicated to him. And in in many respects, I suppose he's a similar character to Geoffrey's Merlin, and I suppose Geoffrey acknowledges this doesn't he because he brings Taliesin in as Merlin's mate if you like so so at one point Merlin has asked the king to let him just go off to the forest but to build him a nice little castle or a nice big house there where he can just go and do his study where he can just study he can study nature and be a sort of you know live a little academic life as a, as a natural philosopher kind of thing and and there he hangs out with Taliesin and Taliesin is his very much is equal in that respect that they're both presented as these very erudite knowledgeable people to, discoursing on the natural world and on on um, on, on what the, what at the time was was as i said sort of cutting edge knowledge about the world because at that time everything was you know for, for most people i suppose everything was just we don't know what's going on it's just the workings of god and and so for Jeffrey to put all of this down, it's in a way that Merlin, and he's still mad at this point, he's still regarded as mad, that he has these insights into the workings of nature, that his madness bring him, that he's able to see, if you like, underneath the surface of the world and see and be able to explain why weather happens and you know why birds migrate and things like that in a way that nobody else has been able to understood because he's got some deeper insight. And when he's then cured of his madness towards the end of the poem, he, he loses that ability. That then goes away. He's not able to do that anymore. Although Taliesin, slightly curiously then, is not presented as mad, but he has similar knowledge at least. In the life of Merlin, Geoffrey makes three lengthy digressions on the subjects of fish and islands, springs and lakes, and finally, birds. During the first digression, the eclectic group of islands named by Taliesin include Thanet, Sri Lanka and Avalon, the island of apples, where intriguingly, Taliesin says, he helped to carry Arthur. Merlin's lecture on birds is also full of curiosities, such as the following bit of information. Pelicans kill their own nestlings and mourn in confusion for three days. Then with their beaks they will peck their own bodies, releasing in rivers blood from their veins which is dropped on the chicks, so restoring their being. It was in fact widely believed that pelicans would cut themselves open to feed their young if no other food could be found. As Anne Lawrence Mathers writes, Merlin was no figure from folklore or the creation of popular tradition. He embodied the cutting edge of medieval science, and his powers were convincingly real. It does, see, it does seem like this... Um, with the madness comes the gift of prophecy and once cured the, the prophecy's gone and the the natural philosophy That's remains. Right. it does yeah. seem a bit like he's, he's he's never described him as you've said as a magician before but it does seem as he's making as emphatic a split from that as possible like out with the prophecies and in with the natural sciences yeah i think in a way that yes and i think there's a sense of i think it seems to me at least that jeffrey's kind of at least hinting there's 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 such a thing as having too much knowledge, you know, and knowing and seeing things too deeply is going to drive you mad, um, or or in, in the eyes of the the rest of the world, you you will appear to be mad at least, because you see too deeply, and actually it's then a a bit of a blessing to have that removed, so you don't have to see so deeply, and that you know the prof. So the idea of the prophecies is 
again, I think it's partly, an, it's not necessarily a radically different thing. It's, it's you know, the, the I suppose if you think in, in, in that mindset of if everything in the world is part of this divine plan and, and this ordered ordered universe d- ordained by by God, then if you're able to see very deeply into this in the way that Merlin can through his madness, the prophetic gift is really just a way, if you like, making deductions about how the understanding how the world works and being able to pr- make predictions into the future based on your your deeper vision of of, of and deeper knowledge of the workings of, of the divine order, if you like. And I think, not that Jeffrey ever says any of this specifically, but it just seems to me that there's a, again, a, there's a hint that what he doesn't do, and again, just to come back to modern examples, he, you know, he's not, he's not Dumbledore or Gandalf where he just has unexplained powers. He, you know, these power, the power of prophecy he has is somehow related to his madness and to his ability to see deeply into the world. So not, you know, so it's not quite the same thing. I know I'm hedging my bets here, but it's not, I don't think Jeffrey ever wants us to think it's, it's magical in the sense of completely inexplicable, but it's, it's, it's something to do with, he's trying in a way to, to give us at least hint to us an explanation for it by, by saying it's the madness that's allowed Merlin to free himself from the you know our blinkers if you like that that we we have on every day and to see see things more deeply and that allows him to understand the world in a deeper way that than than everybody else that's how I th- I see it anyway and that's all we have time for today I'm afraid a huge thank you to Mark Walker uh, for coming on the podcast don't forget to tune back in tomorrow for an extended interview with Mark where we'll talk about everything from dactylic hexameter to translating the hobbit into latin Um, In the meantime, check out his work in the episode description box below, where you'll also find the link to our Patreon page. Thank you everyone for listening, and until next time, happy reading.